Everybody, everybody, it's Anthony Brockton, your main man coming from the mainland of America. And the reason why I say that, because I got a nice, smooth dude coming from the island of America. Uh, I, I, I believe I'm right. America's 50th state. America's the southernmost state, I'm a 50th. Hawaii is the 50th and the southernmost state. No, the 50th and the southernmost state, as I have been corrected by a Hawaiian kind of guy. Real cool dude, too. Y'all gonna like this guy a lot. <laughs> and he's and, and the reason why is because he said he liked doing this. And he's got uh, mm -hmm. a breadth of stories and knowledge and, and places he's been around the world because he's, you know, one of them successful kind of cats and whatnot. And and as a result, he takes advantage of that and, and is seeing things and hearing things and reading things. And he's going to share with you, my friends. Here we are at Strong Inspirations, where I give it to you straight, no chaser. We're going to intoxicate your mind today with some history that I know he's going to say something to make you go, mm-hmm, I did not know that. Watch out. So what I want you to do, my friends, is hit the subscribe button. It's free. It don't cost nothing. We don't ask no information. Really, in layman's terms, it just let me know you like me. See, because I like you already. And I like you because you're watching me. And you're sending me comments. And I love the comments of how uh, this, that, and the other in the video. Uh, you like what I'm doing. You pre you didn't know something that you heard in the video. Uh, I got one person say I'm really telling a lot of people about you because I like uh, the videos you've done and are doing and will do. I'm like, oh, I'm on to something. I even had a, a a lady. I tell you this this short story right quick. I had called out to a Black History Museum in California, a little small town outside of LA. I just found them on Facebook looking at you know see if I could do an interview. And, and as I had introduced myself and I got into my line about why I was calling and I, you know, inviting him to come on the show and what have you, the lady said, stop right there. I said, what? She said, I've been watching you already and I've been thinking I want to call you. It tripped me out. I had to step back off the phone and say, Lord, I must be on something good. She said, yeah. She said, I am so excited that you would call me. She, and it was such a thing that she don't ordinarily answer the telephone. She said, whoa. And I said, whoa, too. So we set it up. She come in on the show. And like this gentleman right here, I, I got to be honest with you, you're my family and what like that. We were supposed to do a little earlier today. But, you know, I mean, I'm weekend, to be honest with you, while we're doing this. And my man, he, he gave me a call, because I sent him a message. I said, can we do a little late? He said, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So here we are to bring it to you. So uh, check it out. Uh, that's what's happening. So, um, you, you, oh, oh, this is what I want to tell you. Uh, let me know, hold on, this is what I want to tell you, because uh, I'm, 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 I'm scattered a little bit right now, everybody, uh, in this regard, because I know I'm really like what he got to say. But did you see the video I did out of New Mexico? I got two of them up. And what happened was when the black people got all the way to New Mexico, they had a, a policy. They had so much land that they gave them land. They call it homestead. And then uh, that's how black people got land over there. And some of them really took advantage of it. Uh, watch those videos. New Mexico. I'm getting close to my man. Did you see the one I did? Uh, of a lady called, her name is Bridget Biddy Mason. She uh, walked all the way from like somewhere in the South, South Carolina, North Carolina, behind her in slaver. He ain't even let the lady ride on the wagon. So she walked, got to take care of everything along the way, so on and so forth. They get the, and she's a midwife, you know, where she helped, you know, people birth their children you know, without a doctor. And uh, once she got to California, she was so proficient at midwifing that uh, she made a lot of money, uh, married a Chinese guy, I think the story goes. They bought a bunch of land in downtown LA. 
they bought a bunch of land. It's, it look her up. And we're well, looking up the video I got. It's, it's about a lady who talks about light skin versus dark skin. There's a dynamic there. Um, and some even internal prejudices. And, and, and so on and so on. She talks about that, but she also tells other stories. And one of them is about this lady who's a great aunt, uh, Bridget uh, Biddy Mason. Did you see the one I did out of um, out of uh, Oklahoma where the lady is a black Seminole Indian and she talks about her heritage and how she lives. Well, not, she was in Oklahoma. Now she's on the edge of Texas where, you know, the migrants could just walk over. She says, they, you know, it's, it's them occurrences all the time. Watch that. There's a, there's a few of them on, them on the Seminole Indian heritage on the show. And so, uh, Oh, I got one I just released the other day. This is a good one, too. All of them are good. This one is a, about a, a guy who talks about the history of Black music in America. The history of Black music. Watch that video. So uh, we, we, well, I'm jamming here, uh, everybody. And then what I want you to do, as you might know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm serious about my game. Took me three years to do this documentary titled Business in the Black. The Rise of Black Business in America is streaming on Amazon. I, I love for you to watch this. It, it, it's going to be good. It's going to teach you stuff like the names of enslaved people in America, Black folk, who uh, were able to own a business and then take the profits from the business and buy their freedom. That's just one component of the documentary Business in the Black. And then, like I say, it's streaming on Amazon. And then, please, everybody, my numbers is up. I had some really good nights uh, this past, you know, days this past week. A lot of people ordered the, the book that I wrote titled Black Business Book. And, you know, what I do is talk about similar to the documentary, but much more of like, for example, all the ways slaves gain their freedom. Did you know that some of them sued for it? Might not have known that. I talk about it. I even named who they were and what happened. And the book is uh, available only at present on my website because Amazon got enough money. I'm going to try to see if I can get y'all to just go to the website because every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school across America. And so I got uh, in the schools, that some schools have called me and said, can they get on that list? And so I need y'all to help me out. Order a book. Every 10th book I sell, I donate one. All this is available on my website, businessintheblack.net. Businessintheblack.net. You can follow me on Twitter at A Strong Dream. And I'm on Instagram. I think it's uh, A Strong One, One, something like that. But I'm on Instagram. And then, like, all that's noted on my website, businessintheblack.net. Now you hear me use this term strong a lot. Strong is my favorite word. I love the word strong. I'm gonna keep saying it. We got a strong soul brother on the channel today. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, stability, and grace. And that is my introduction to the young man. Good looking guy. Come on and uh, tell us your name. Let's get it on. Thank you for being on Strong Inspirations. Aloha, Anthony. I'm uh, Andre Wooten. I'm an attorney in Honolulu, and I uh, moved to Hawaii in uh, 1980. Uh, but originally, I was born in Seattle. Grew up on the same block as a guitar player you might have heard of by the name of Jimi Hendrix. I was in uh, third grade with Jimmy's little brother, Leon, who was in jail when uh, Jimmy uh, was a big hit. Um, and I also knew a guy uh, that you might have heard of by the name of Bruce Lee. Uh, buried my daddy, who was the second black judge in Seattle in the same cemetery as Bruce Lee, who I met when I was 15, before he went off into Hollywood and became uh, Cato and Black Hornet and did all those movies. But um, some of my uh, friends were students of Bruce Lee's, and everybody in uh, Seattle uh, wanted to play guitar at a certain point. My natural father is a guy by the name of Howard Wooten. And you've probably seen his picture because the Air Force uses his Tuskegee Airmen uh, flight school graduation picture on recruiting posters to this day. Uh, and when I first saw that, it really shocked the sh 
whatever out of me. I mean, yes. nobody asked permission. I'm, I'm in a bookstore thumbing through ESPN, the magazine, and I see a big picture of my daddy who's been dead for a long time um, in that magazine. But anyway, um, talked to one of my um, Air Force clients uh, who said that that picture is all over the world on Air Force bases. Uh, me, um, I graduated from high school in 66 and uh, you either went to college or you went to Vietnam. I should say that uh, my mother is a school teacher and so she prepared me well for college. I always got good grades. Um, and if I didn't, um, I had to deal with her. Yeah. And um, my grandfather, um, Howard Wooten, uh, was the principal mm -hmm. of the colored school and a graduate of uh, Prairie View. My grandparents were both graduates of Prairie View. Um, grandmother, uh, who died before I came along, I saw a picture of her uh, graduating in 1917. My grandfather was a World War I vet, and um, then he put together uh, one of the largest farms uh, in the USA. Uh, he had 12 kids and left, uh, I should say, my grandfather, uh, we're from Texas. Yeah, uh, the yeah, story that. goes that um, my people were brought in to Galveston uh, in 1840. Uh, as slaves and this okay, was okay so that's the plantation in your family yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. we were marched up the road from galveston to uh crockett texas in houston county you may have heard of davy crockett anyway we were sold yeah. on the block there oh really uh, ever since uh we were enslaved by a person named rogers and so we didn't take that name yeah. and so we took the name of wooten and i do not know why other than we must have done some service for us. Yeah, I know my uh, great grandparents had 500 acres of Texas by 1900. Oh, really? And they uh, got 125 acres each. My grandfather had 12 kids, left each of his kids 125 acres. So my father died when he was 28. And so I have his 125 acres of Texas. Okay, let me stop you there. I don't mean no disrespect, but you you rolling so good, I can't get a question in because you you answering the questions I got. So I gotta I gotta come up with a with, with some questions just you know off the taste because um, uh, you're doing a tremendous job with with the information. Uh, let's go back to growing up in uh, in Seattle. Did did you grow up in the black neighborhood, uh, middle you know, with a black and white, or what what was that dynamic? We grew up in the heart of heart of Seattle. Like I say, my, my daddy died in the Tuskegee Airmen. He died when I was four months old. So when my daddy died, my mom and I, we wound up in the projects. Oh, um, really? But a, year, but a year later, my mom, who became a school teacher, and her older sister, who was a nurse, they bought a duplex uh, in the heart of town. So my mother tells this story that she and my father were waiting for the bus one day when uh, a brother drove by and my father pointed out, there goes the black lawyer, a guy named Charlie Stokes, who was actually the first black man in, well, excuse me, he thought he was the first black man in the Washington state legislature. So after my daddy died, two years later, my mom hooked up with the only black lawyer. Well, he was one of the few black lawyers in the state of Washington. Yeah. And in 1950, he was in the Washington state legislature and pushed through the first uh, housing um, integration bills uh, in the state of Washington. Okay, let, let me stop you there. Let me stop you there. Let me stop. There. I want to stay on that just a tad. Well, did, did you did you have white friends where you grew up? I, I'm not in the projects. I wouldn't suspect, though, right? After my mother married the lawyer, yeah, uh, moved into a house in yeah. what's called the CD, the Central District of Seattle, the Central District of Seattle. Okay, part of town. We okay. were on 25th Avenue, which meant that if you walked toward the ocean, um, 25 blocks, you would be at the uh, at the pier, um, and okay. downtown was included in that. So, okay. um, to answer your question, I was the only black kid in the Jewish nursery school uh, when I was three years hey. old. Um, my parents were into 
it was the fifties and people were integrating stuff. So I integrated this, this Jewish nursery school. It turns out really that the Jewish people were moving out of our neighborhood. Sure. Um, there were, Seattle was always integrated. I mean, I went to grade school with um, Japanese kids, Chinese kids. Oh, so really? I mean, it was mixed. It, it was predominantly black, um, but you know, Seattle, like in, in that neighborhood, it depends on what part of the hill. Seattle's a very hilly town. Oh, really? So, um, there was a affluent neighborhood overlooking the lake um, and then in the valley on the other side of the hills where the black people were and the people in the factory workers and everybody kind of worked at Boeing. My parents uh -huh. met at Boeing um, in uh, 46 after the war, actually, uh -huh. going, uh, going through college. So there was a, a movement, gentrification. When I was 12, uh -huh. uh, my parents bought a new house and we moved so-called out of the CD. But we only moved like a mile and a half away. Yeah. 33rd Avenue to 33rd South. And it was a, a new neighborhood, a different neighborhood. Um, you know, and my parents still have that house. Let me ask you this. Where, 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 where did you uh, come to like Black history like you do? That was just a natural for me. Really? I, mean, I, I was a history major. See, because you could have, let me, let me say this. You could have lost your, your I mean, maybe you could have, couldn't have. And, and this is a question. Could you have lost your blackness being in that neighborhood? Um, no. You know, playing with the white no. kids and, you know, we hear that happens when they move to the suburbs. Well, I've never lived in the suburbs. But I'm saying, but when they do move to the suburbs, we know that could happen to us. Well, I was still in the city. Yeah. You no. Know? And even though when, when, when we went, when I was in Franklin, you know, it was 10% black. But we were the presidents of all the classes. So oh, we, really? Yeah. yeah it, 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 like in my neighborhood, uh, the second neighborhood I moved into, my best yeah. friend, he was another lawyer's kid. I mean, the, the black professionals lived in that neighborhood. I got you. And old man Greenlee, now old man Greenlee, he was about 6'3", and he was a tan lawyer. He had six boys, and all of them went to law school. Two of them okay, I love it. So they used to practice down in front of my house. Uh, one of them was the state open karate champion. He played D-back for the Chicago Bears. Oh, really? Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Did you, did you, do you know of any uh, racial strife in Seattle? There's always racial strife everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you got to be specific about it. I don't know. I mean, did they have a riot? Pardon? Did Seattle have a riot? When MLK was was gunned down, yeah, Seattle parts of Seattle burned. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. we had a Black Panther party, you know, Aaron. Oh, Dixon. did you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. My, I was always in school. I mean, I was I was a lawyer's kid. Yeah. I'm going to college, yeah. you know. Yeah. But when I was in college, I was vice president of the Black Student Union at Reed College in Oregon. And they voted to take over the administration and demand the creation of a Black Studies program. So in December of 1968, me and six other brothers locked ourselves up inside of the president's oh, really? office for a week. Love and it. then the other, there were only like eight brothers in the school. There were about 20 sisters. And so they yeah, were protesting yeah. and, the, and the brother who was our spokesman, he was out and doing the talking. And after a week of me swearing, I've never locked myself inside of anything ever again. With the okay. But anyway, they agreed to create a Black Studies program. Okay, let me stop you there. I like it. And we're going to stay on that just a second. When you all were meeting, and I'm trying to get you to think back if you were back in the days in the civil rights, when did you all make the decision that we've had enough of not having what we want and we're going to make a move? How does that decision go, and how could you think they might have done it during the civil rights era? If you, you know, this was back. in '68. MLK was gunned down in April of '68. I started a new school in Oregon in the fall of '68, and the school that I went to, Reed, has a very extremely liberal reputation. I mean, liberal to the point of communist. I mean, John Reed was a red. You know, Warren Beatty did a movie called Reds, 
Okay. And that's the John Reed that I'm talking about, the guy who went to Moscow and joined up with Lenin. Really? <laughs> so, you know. Okay. So, okay. so anyway, um, it was the times. It, I, I think it was the times. That, that kind of thing was going on all over the country. Yeah. It was was there any threat when y'all made the move? There was a threat of getting arrested and locked up. Oh, and really? Getting out of school, and you never know. My... I called my parents the night before we did this operation just to give them a heads up and say, you know, get the bail money ready or whatever. And my mother just freaked out. He said, I, I can't so imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine. And my dad, my stepfather, he was pretty cool about it. Now, he had just been appointed to a judgeship, the second black judge in Seattle at that time. And Charles yeah. Stokes, he was, he was pretty cool. Yeah. Now, there were history books all around my house. My grandfather was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. So education was our game. You know, what, 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 let me stop you there. Was there a book that you read school. or some story that you heard that influenced you, you know, like a Malcolm X book, anything like that in the early days? There were books at the house. I mean, we always got Jet and Ebony and all that kind of stuff. And I do right. remember reading a book about um, Sin Q and Amistad. You know, when this is back in grade school, it wasn't in school. It was just something we had around the house. Okay. You know, about San Q and Amistad. So I knew about Amistad. You know, you know that story? The, the Amistad uh, ship when they. Uh, yeah, over, I just took, saw the movie. Took, I just yeah. saw the movie, you know, yeah. uh, came out a couple of days ago. But anyway, I knew about that. Yeah. And I remember being in like the fourth grade. And just walking around the school wondering how did black people wind up in the political and economic position uh, that we've been subjected to and i've always been fascinated by trying to find the answer you know to that story and so i was a history major and got a degree in history and then after getting a degree in history what the heck do you do with a ba in history well not a whole lot sure. but daddy was a lawyer so you know i was always yeah. It's a matter of how you're going to continue to support yourself in the style to which they've made you accustomed. Yeah, sure, so sure. If you sure, can do sure. it, I can do it. And, yeah. I, you know, it wasn't easy, but I did wind up graduating from law school. Yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> so now you, you've moved up the timeline and now you, you've traveled a lot different places, you know, because per the pictures you were showing me and, and, and you talk about, you study black history. Tell us a little bit about that. After I graduated from law school, I, I had a mentor at the University of Washington. There was a brother named Art France who gave me four different jobs while I was in law school and then after. So after I graduated and stuff like that, he was the director of the Black Studies program at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he hired me to teach African-American history and constitutional law for the Black Studies program there. At the time, I was actually working as a lawyer for the Corporation Council of the City Attorney's Office in Seattle. But I, I got a month off and I, I took my first trip to Africa in August of 79. Um, of, uh, and um, had a, a nice ticket uh, with unlimited stops and do a circle around um, Africa. I was just doing West Africa. Because in those days, I really wasn't really thinking of Egypt as Africa. You know, a lot of people of, don't for some reason. I've heard that. Pardon? A lot of people don't for some reason. I it didn't really hit me until I was like in my forties. And um, but anyway, I went to West Africa and I had a great time. And that was interesting and stuff like that. Um, and then I was, you know, teaching my course in African American history. But then I I I, I began to read. Uh, well, Ivan Van Sertima. Ivan Van Sertima. And the uh, journals of uh, African civilization. I um, ran into Renoko Rashidi um, when I was president of the African American Association in Honolulu in the early 80s. We were lobbying to get the Martin Luther King holiday passed in the state of Hawaii. And the okay. state of Hawaii was one of the last ones to officially um, make it a legal holiday because we were dealing with 
you know, realities of that, you know, African Americans are only 3% officially of the population of Hawaii. And then the 100,000 military and their families don't get counted in the population because they tend to vote in their home states and they tend to keep their driver's licenses in their home states. And that's sure. the pool from which juries are selected. Sure. So, sure. so anyway, we no. had to convince people that the Martin Luther King holiday was about freedom for everybody and showing that you understand that this freedom is for all Americans, regardless of race, creed, or color. And it took a couple of years, but we finally got that done. Now, let me go back to the, the first time you went to Africa. Were you nervous? How did you feel the first time you went? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I remember flying into Douala, Cameroon at 11 o'clock one night, flew out of Rome, uh, one day and flew into Douala, Cameroon, and I had a like a guidebook telling me where to go and this, that, and the other from Pan Am or something or other. And I got into a cab, and the brother says, "You don't want to go there." You like he, he, he just took me where he took me to an African hotel, and it was interesting. It was it was it was it was interesting. I mean, they showed you mean me. by African because it was it wasn't like a Hilton or something like that. What do you mean an African no, hotel? So owned and run by Africa. Oh, really? As opposed to, yeah, the Hilton and the... Yeah, yeah. And, and the European company. It was a nice hotel? It was. It was. I mean, I do remember one morning waking up and there was all these crazy bugs flying around and I just pulled the sheet back over my head and yeah. ran away about 20 minutes later. Yeah. At that time, Andrew Young had just been fired as UN ambassador by Jimmy Carter because he'd been talking to the PLO. And so Jimmy Carter gave him a official um, US plane and uh, he was doing a tour of Africa. So at the embassy, uh, there were these parties that were being thrown for Andy, um, um, Andy uh, Young. Andrew Young, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I went to some of those. And, oh, really? Uh, some of the African uh, businessmen and stuff like that. I mean, I ran into some guys who wanted me to sell them some minibuses, some guys who wanted me to give them, sell them like 20 uh, ice cream yogurt machines. And so I was looking into doing that. And that's when I realized there were no American banks on, uh, at least not in Cameroon. All of the banking was controlled through France. And so that okay. was how, you know, they were maintaining the control. I mean... You know, if you're dealing with serious money, you got to deal with letters, letters of credit and all this. Yeah, kind of sure, stuff. sure. And, you know, you got to have your French together or trust somebody. Now, I'd studied French in school, but it's not the same as being fluent. Yeah, right, right. Sure, it's sure. Like doing, doing business. And, but it was it was an interesting education. Did, 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 did you have a moment that scared you while you were there? Uh, that Like they might want to rob you or anything like that? Did you have that kind of... That was in Senegal. That was in Senegal. I, I went up, I, I, I left uh, Douala, Cameroon, and flew into um, Lagos, Nigeria, and took a taxi to Lagos into the city. And I saw so many soldiers and so much guns. I just, just take me back to the airport. I, 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 the vibe in Lagos was just. Oh, really? That and, 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 and even getting a visa to get to Nigeria. I, Flew into New York because my sister was uh, working for Essence in those days. My sister was Stephanie Stokes. She's a writer and she was a uh, number two manager at Essence for years. So I had a place to stay in New York yeah. um, with my sister. So I went there to get visas and stuff and um, went to the Nigerian embassy to get a visa. And they said, well, come back tomorrow. And I said, well, I'm here today. Why can't I get it today? He says, because in Lagos, they, the Americans always make us come back tomorrow. Right. And, and so that was just, you know, just the vibes and the attitude. Oh, really? I wound up having to go to Paris to get a visa to go to Cameroon. It's like either go to D.C. or go to Paris. I went to Paris and spent, spent the weekend in Paris. Because when I got there, um, they didn't work on Friday. Uh, so I had to stay the weekend in Paris. I mean, that's you know, yeah, that ain't so bad. bad. That ain't so bad. What what is a visa? Is it just like an application to be ex accepted into the country? I've never gotten a visa. Well, 
the application is part of it, but the visa is a stamp that they put on your passport so that when you get there, they let you in. Okay. If you don't okay. have a visa, you got to do some fast talking or yeah. go back. You know. Oh, I got you. I got you. Now, there are certain countries. I remember I flew into London one time and my passport had expired. I hadn't realized it expired. I had to start talking then. I said, wait a minute, we're friends, we're allies. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, <laughs> and really? I had to get my passport renewed um, at, the, at the American Embassy in London. Oh, really? So yeah. as you do these travels, um, what, what does it teach you? Oh, it teaches me lots of stuff. It teaches me lots of stuff. I mean, <sighs> are, are you, people the same everywhere in the world? To Egypt, you really won't understand world history because the 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 beautiful black stuff doesn't leave Egypt. I remember in the seventies, I went and saw the King Tut exhibit. You know, they they brought the golden mask out and they brought out certain things and this, that, and the other. And it's interesting what they show. But if you go to Cairo and go up into the second floor of the Cairo Antiquities Museum, you see all of the King Tut stuff. And you see those statues where he's painted coal black. And they shows his history and stuff like that. There are the statue of Zoser. Zoser built the first pyramid, the step pyramid. He was third dynasty. 2750 BC, he left a statue in the pyramid that is now in the Cairo Antiquities Museum. And that statue is coal black. The stone comes from Nubia and he's wearing beautiful dreadlocks. His nose is busted because that's a political statement, um, but the dreadlocks are still beautiful. There are statues of beautiful dreadlock pharaohs, but you only see them in the Cairo Antiquities Museum. I, I, the, the statues that I saw, I've been to the Louvre and videoed yeah. all of their Egyptian stuff. I've been yeah. to the British Museum. I've videoed all their stuff. Um, went to um, the Vatican. The Vatican doesn't have a whole lot of stuff, but I videoed that. And then they told me that the best Museum for Egyptian uh, Antiquities in Italy is in Turin, uh, Italy. So I took the train up there with my video cameras and I videoed all that. I haven't really worked on that, but that sure. was yeah, It's interesting. But then you begin to see that the Europeans take the statues that they can relate to. They take the ones that are more ambiguous. You know, they take the ones, and then, you know, everybody, I mean, African-Americans, African people, are a variety of colors, you know. Yeah, sure, you know, sure, sure. Tone, you know, in the various families, you got, sure. you know, ranges and stuff like that. And so sure. Egypt is like that, you know. But there were strong African uh, leaders. And, and those were the paramount ones, the kings um, of the different phases. Um, the very first uh, dynasty, non -remensis. And then uh, after the collapse, um, the Enteps and Mentuhotep, and then the 18th. Okay, dynasty. stop right there, because you you jamming. What is, a dynasty is what? A dynasty is basically a family of rulers, a group of rulers who have some kind of family connection. Many times, the family connection is through the daughter of the king. The 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 the, the new king would be the husband of the daughter of the king. So once you run out of those family connections, and sometimes there was brothers marrying sisters and stuff like that. Oh, but once yeah. you run out of that, if you got a new family, that's a new dynasty. So ultimately, there were basically 30 um, of the um, Egyptian dynasties beginning around 3200 BC. And then depending upon when you want to say Egypt fell, they fell to the uh, Persians in 525 uh, BC. And we're, um, and then uh, Alexander the Great or Alexander the Greek came in and threw off Persian rule, and then there was a Greek rule from 330 BC, um, and then uh, Julius Caesar came in around 30 BC. Okay, it's, you you sound like you know the dynasty. Is it give us a black dynasty and what they did? Well, the very first pharaoh was a guy named Narmer Mensis. 
And Narmer Mensis came down the Nile with his army from the south, from the southern region, came down the Nile, made war against King Abascom. There is in the Cairo Antiquities Museum a ancient relic called the Palette of Narmer, and it depicts that battle where Narmer took the head of Abascom and then married Abascom's daughter and unified the nation, making the first nation on earth. Really? So that's what that's and these are black people doing this. These are black people doing this because they come from the south. That's the, the one thing about Egypt is its orientation is reverse of Western civilization. You know, when you okay. look at the map of, of Africa, uh -huh. the Nile flows south to north. Which is rare. Isn't that something rare about that? It, it flows from the heart of the continent, from uh, the Rift Valley, uh, Uganda, and uh, where humanity evolved in uh, the Rift Valley in Kenya. And then it flows, uh, that's the White Nile, flows up that way. The Blue Nile starts in the high mountains of Ethiopia and then flows down from Ethiopia. They join at Khartoum. And, and meet there and then they, they come on down. So um, historically, the inundation of the Nile, that flood before they put in any dams, that flood would bring the rich earth down from Ethiopia and would cover the flame, the, the, the farming plain of, of Egypt so that they wouldn't have to really fertilize. They wouldn't really have to do anything but just drop seeds. You know, yeah, and so it was a bread basket, you know, of, 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 of certainly Egypt and, and the world. The other thing is the language, the language, the hieroglyphics. Yes. It's also called the Medunetcher, which is the sacred writings. And in the hieroglyphics, the name for Egypt, well, there is no word in Egypt in, in the hieroglyphics. Egypt is a Greek word that was applied to the nation of Kemet after it was conquered by the Greeks. And they began to get access to the temples and access to uh, the priests and try to understand some of the ancient writings. But the name of ancient Africa was written in the language of the indigenous people, the Medonetra, the hieroglyphics, and were written with a pictograph, the symbol for land, the symbol for black, and the symbol for people. And it literally said, Black people's land. That's what Kemet means. Oh, really? Right. So, uh, so, and, 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 yeah, when you, okay, so I want to go back to Dynasty because we, we hear about it. You got a whole group of families. Is there a nice Black dynasty where the ruler wasn't killing his people and everybody prospered? Is there one of those? Dynasties are, 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 uh, are complex. One dynasty I, I have to, I want to mention is the 18th dynasty. The 18th dynasty, the last king of the 18th dynasty was one they called King Tut, Tutankhamun. Hey, we've heard that name. That was the last king of the 18th dynasty. But the first king of the 18th dynasty was a guy named Amosi. And he married his sister, Navatari. Now, Back around 1600, Egypt had been invaded by some people from the north called the Hexos. The Hexos ruled Egypt for, it's debatable, anywhere from 150 to 200 years. And so the royal family retreated into the south and they made allies with the Nubians and they came down and made war against these northern invaders. Simonkari, was one of those pharaohs. He died fighting the nor northern invaders. And his son died fighting the northern invaders. But Amosi, the younger son, he won that battle and ran the northern invaders out of Kemet and established indigenous local black rule again. So that's Amosi. And um, yeah. yeah. Now how, how good was King Tut? We know that name. How good was King Tut? What was his claim to fame? His claim to fame was that he had the smallest tomb in the Valley of the Kings and Queens, and consequently, 
uh, they didn't find it for thousands and thousands of years. But in terms of being an accomplished king or person, um, that's really not the case. Oh, However, really? he followed up. His father was one called uh, Amenophis IV, who changed his name to Agnaton. And Agnaton is uh, rumored to have been the first monotheist. I mean, he was controversial in that he uh, was moving to change the religion uh, of Kemet. And of course, uh, when you want to change the religion, you got some priests of the old religion, the conservatives, who um, don't like that. Yeah, sure. And so sure. Um, uh, the rule of Amosi, and actually I videoed his, his sarcophagus in the Cairo Antiquities Museum, shows him wearing dreadlocks as well. But Amosi may have been assassinated. Um, his wife, uh, Nefertiti, is We've heard that name. one of the statues that they want to use around. But the provenance of that statue is very dubious. Um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of history there. She may, a lot of times the Egyptians to seal treaties, they would send a princess, you know, um, so that there would be a family relationship and stuff like that. There were a lot of that going on in those days. So she might not have even been actually Egyptian. In so many movies, other than the color of the skin of the actors, per se, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of one, Ben-Hur or something like that, how, 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 how kind of, and now you pick a movie and if you if you can, and dissect it just a little bit, how, how true to what happened other than the, the actors might it be? I mean, they, they always captured somebody and then they had slaves. And then the slaves worked and built the pyramids, things of that sort. Is that is that the truthness well, to it? The, or what? the lie that slaves built the pyramids uh, is 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 totally false, and um, oh, that's really? been done for political reasons. Yeah, I mean, if you really study the history of it, I mean, the first so-called Hebrew Joseph supposedly came into Kemet long about eighteen hundred, and that coincides with the Hexos and all of that kind of stuff. But the pyramids were built about a thousand years before that. Um, the pyramids were a public community project. Um, that was a way in which the ancient Kimites organized themselves. The way in which the society worked, um, when the Nile flood came down, um, you know, they planted, but um, there were times when, um, you know, there wasn't farming work to do. And so the king organized these building projects, basically. Um, and that's what that's what they were. Oh, um, okay. What, what, what is the dy dynamic to this? Uh, you were asking we, we, a question about go ahead, go ahead, a famous go ahead. Uh, African pharaoh. And in Central Park in New York City, I don't know if you've been there, but there's yeah. an Egyptian obelisk. There's an Egyptian obelisk in Central Park that they call the Cleopatra's Needle. But when you read, if you can read, and even on the inscription itself, this what Cleopatra had nothing to do with this obelisk. This obelisk was starved, carved for King Tutmosis III. Tutmosis III lived around 1450 BC, and he was the Napoleon of his day. He extended the boundaries of Kemet, Egypt, a thousand miles in all directions. And um, he took tribute from, from basically all the known world in those days. Oh, really? There is a obelisk carved for Tutmosis III on the banks of the Thames River also. There's an obelisk carved for Tutmosis III in Rome. In fact, um, talking about videos, I'm working on a video now about the African monuments that are, are in Rome and the oldest Egyptian um, obelisk and monument in Rome was carved for Tutmosis III. Oh, really? There's also an obelisk carved for Tutmosis III in Constantinople as well. But the obelisk um, for Tutmosis III uh, stands in front of uh, the uh, Cathedral de Gregorio, which is the oldest cathedral in Rome, and the place in which Constantine 
convene the convention of uh, priests in 30, 330 AD and um, created the uh, Catholic religion. Okay. I, I, okay, and I know we're jumping around because you, you're saying so much good stuff, and I got all these questions because I just got no clue. I, everybody, I this. Uh, let me give you another question. That what is the timeline for the world? What I mean by that, you, people say BC, and then and that goes from zero to something, and then after BC or before BC, what is the timeline of the world? Boy, I mean, the, the Earth is billions, about four billion years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, up until about 11,000 BC, Europe was predominantly covered by ice. And so the only place, I mean, people lived up there, but they were, you know, you, they're living in caves and stuff because it was ice age. Okay, um, let, me, let, me, let me stop you. Uh, you you on point, and I, this is where I want to get to. Life starts in Africa. Let's say. Indeed. And then from Africa, the African people rule Africa for a whole bunch of years. There's dynasties and things of that sort. And then people leave and then they start filtering out to Europe or wherever. Is that right. correct? Right, right. I you know, I, I read a book by a guy named Oppenheimer called um, uh, uh, Africa, the Garden of Eden. And, um, oh, it combines to um, look at DNA evidence, um, uh, proving that, you know, all humanity is related and has a uh, African origin. Um, various forms of humanity were migrating out of Africa for over like 2 million years. You know, even the Cro-Magnons and, and the Neanderthals were originally Africans, um, and then they migrated uh, north. Um, Okay, so now we we rolling. So we got all these years, and BC means before Christ. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just that's kind of an that's I mean that's one way to look at it. Okay. Another way to look at it would be to look at it as black civilization. You know, because right, okay, not the ancient civilizations in those days like Carthage that had made war against Rome, Hannibal, you can't forget Hannibal when you talk about your bad dudes, you know, because the military colleges still teach Hannibal's tactics, you know, uh, to, to this day. Um, so, so, so black people started out. And so when we go on this theory, blacks came first, they ruled, then white people took over and they do what they do to us and through slavery and so on and so forth. So somebody might say, rule first, had favor, then don't have favor, and will rule again. Is that some theory to that of the world shape? I mean, you can't remember, you can't forget the year uh, 7-Eleven. In 7-Eleven, General Torak crossed the isthmus from Morocco um, into Spain and uh, led to the Moorish invasion of Spain. So the Moors ruled Spain up until 1492, when Boabdil, um, the caliph of um, was it Granada, abdicated and, and um, vacated. So in 1492, um, the Christians uh, uh, established basically um, the Inquisition, um, which was basically, you could say it was a religious thing. They wanted all of the Muslims out, but when you um, run all the Muslims out, you run all the black, brown people out too. Um, the guy, um, uh, Salman Rushdie, Salman Rushdie wrote a book called The Moor's Last Sigh, yeah. which uh, talks about the legacy of Boabdil. Boabdil was the last caliph of Granada. And, uh, and um, uh, I like Salman Rushdie's books because he talks about chapters of history that I just have vague um, suggestion of understanding to, and he fleshes them out. Okay. Like that. Okay. You know. Let me let me let me. How about this one? So, Africa is the start of it all, and people are moving around Africa, and some dynasties are ruling. They capture another dynasty, so on and so forth in Africa, and then people start leaving, 
at some point and migrate in other parts of Europe. And then we go over to Europe, like you said, the Moors and others, and we capture them and make them, uh, we take over their land. And then at some point they get more powerful. And I'm talking about the Europeans. And then they come back and take over Africa. Is that the, is that the way it goes? I mean, one can certainly look at a historical trend of that, um, but it was piecemeal and, and never really was the plan. Um, you know, the Portuguese were the first of the sailor navigators to eventually, um, you know, sail down the west coast of Africa to get around the, get around the horn or the hump and, and get down to uh, Angola. And uh, at first they were fair traders. You know, at first they were fair traders. The okay. uh, king of Angola uh, sent his sons to uh, Portugal for education. Uh, uh, but then um, the Portuguese started slave raiding and the uh, king of um, Angola began to complain about that. Um, but uh, it never stopped. And so Queen Nzinga um, succeeded him and she made war against the Portuguese. Um, for a long time, but, but unsuccessfully, and she could not stop the incursion. Um, there's a book, uh, I wish I had the, I had the name, but there was one book uh, called The Hundred Year War Against the Ashanti. It took the British a hundred years to fight their way into um, Kumasi and in, in the Ashanti. Um, really? Yeah, um, I was in London and um, doing some video in a museum there where they had the Benin bronzes and a lot of plunder that they'd taken from Africa. But one of the other things they had, they also had preserved newspaper clippings from uh, um, talking about the uh, invasion of uh, Kumasi. And they were just tallying up the plunder. It was all about the gold and the plunder and why should these black people have all this gold when we don't have any? Oh, you know, really? Okay. Think about it. Where, where are the big gold mines in Europe? Right. I mean, you can think of gold mines in America, certainly in Africa, you know, but where are they in Europe? Oh, okay. I, okay, I, I want to get the, the viewers to this point. Okay, let's say Black people were the smartest ones because we were developing the science, the math, the astrologies and all that. But people in America might feel that white people eventually became smarter than us to capture us. No, it's, it was the divide and conquer thing. I look at it. I don't. Oh, really? Don't capture that. There's two things. One, there was a big meeting in Brussels, Belgium, in 1872 when the European powers divided up Africa. They made a deal not to fight each other. But they'll unite and, you know, the British will take this part, the French will take this part. And uh, so the Africans never knew that all the white people were united against them. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And so the Africans are thinking, well, we're Dahomey, we're Benin, and we're independent nations, but had no idea that all of the white people had um, made a deal, you know, to attack them. And, and at the same time, um, Jomo Kenyatta, lived through the entire colonial period of Kenya and became president. Um, my father was a Tuskegee Airman. I did not know that um, England had brothers from the colonies who were flying for them, for the RAF. I met a brother named Dudley Thompson. Dudley Thompson was a Jamaican lawyer. And it, it turns out that his niece was a friend of my sister's and they worked together at Essence. But um, I met Dudley down in, down in Jamaica. Uh, Dudley said he, he was working as a lawyer in Tanzania uh, in the 60s. He got a call from an old college buddy of his named Jomo Kenyatta. And Jomo said, I need a lawyer. They think I'm leading the Mau Mau and they're going to hang me. And so uh, Dudley says he loaded up his shotgun and his pistols and he drove up and and called the press and, and basically he defended Jomo Kenyatta and kept him from getting hung. And um, uh, Okay, I got you. Well, I want to go back to this and I, uh, as we, you know, move along in this timeline and stuff like that. If I don't get, if my viewers don't get anything else, 
white people are not smarter than black people. No, they're not. No, they're not. But they but, study but, different things and they're concerned about some different things. A lot of people, have you ever heard of Mansa Munsa? Okay, I've heard that. Okay, well, Mansa Munsa led a big hodge from, he was emperor of Mali, around about 330 AD. He led a hodge, a pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, and it took several years. And he took so much gold with him that he, you know, wrecked the gold standard in Egypt and, and Mecca. And he brought back with him uh, doctors and architects and scholars. Um, and uh, so he did two things. I mean, he enhanced uh, uh, Mali, his, his nation, but he also um, created a lot of jealousy among the Arabs um, that um, he dropped all that gold on. And he didn't perceive and understand uh, the fireworks and the dynamite. Um, if the uh, Jamaicans, excuse me, if the um, Malians and the Africans uh, had worked on their own armaments, um, they would have been in a better position. To, uh, to, to, to fight off the Europeans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the history of Japan, of course, it was easier for them because it was an island, but they, um, you know, controlled who was coming in and, and this, that, and the other, and um, they limited the guns. They limited the guns. Okay, let's go with this one then. What did the, and, and you've alluded to this, what did the Africans do wrong? If we would have done something differently, the world would have taken a different time, different slant. There might not have been slavery in America and throughout the, 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 the transatlantic. What, 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 could, what could have they have done differently if they could have band together that could have changed the, 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 the face of history? Well, that's the essential thing. Um, we allowed ourselves to be divided too easily. We allowed ourselves to be divided too easily. And if we had stuck together and not sold each other, you know, as slaves, regardless of, of what, you know, the um, amount of bribe or, or money was, yeah. um, we would have been in a stronger position. That and develop our own guns. Um, that's one thing. That and and not accept somebody else's religion, you know, and not accept, you know, uh, an image of God that doesn't look like you, you know. When you look at the, the old religions of Kemet, um, their gods are black. I mean, Amun-Ra was a black god. But people still say amen today, worshiping the black god of Kemet. Really? Oh. Um. I mean, the Temple of Amun Ra is the oldest and largest temple on the face of the earth. It's it's sixty five acres. It's much bigger than the Vatican and all that other stuff. Oh, Although really? it's in these days, but when you go in there, you know these were some bad motor scooters here. Yes, I got you. So if we would have stuck stuck together, we could have and, and built guns and not had such a caring attitude. We could have changed the face of, of, of history, so to speak, maybe. Well, we could have stood back, stood back. That one book I, I was, was alluding to about the 100-year um, yeah, yeah. battle that it took to fight the way into the Ashanti capital, um, the author talks about the fact that that's five generations. And so when Kumasi had strong generals uh, and leaders, um, you know, you don't always get that from generation to generation. You know? Oh, okay. As we kind of almost come to a close, give and you have done this. Give us and you, and you talked about the one lady who fought back for a bunch of years. Give us some other good stories of in Black history, going back to those right. days. I do want to say that I've um, I do um, uh, programs on these stories. This is my first trip to Egypt. And okay. this is running around, I call it uh, busting the Cleopatra's needle, Tutmosis conspiracy. Okay. Um, because the obelisk that they're naming the Cleopatra's needle in, in Central Park doesn't have a doggone thing to do with Cleopatra. It has everything to do with Tutmosis III, but that's how they're hiding our history from us. They're renaming things. Oh, really? And we have to scrape back through the history to realize what the original name, what our original name was. 
what, what, what do you want people? What, what if you was to say something to black people who think white people are better than us? Uh, what would you say to them? Do your homework, and yeah. and and we gotta feel better about each other uh, ourselves, don't we? Well, we should. We should. I mean, you know, you gotta respect each other, but it all depends on what people are doing. Yeah, you know, well, and I, people are doing things on 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 different levels. The, the, the big, the big, the one big story that I like a lot, and I'm delving into it more, is is what the Moors did. The Moors was conquering the, um, the world. You know, the word Moor in Latin, that's just Latin for black. It's not like a race of people. That's just the Latin word for black. Really? Yeah. And, and they was they was going through conquering other nations. Oh, definitely. Definitely. They, it had to do with the Moorish in, in, invigoration. I mean, the Arabs came through, came out of Mecca and invaded Egypt in 641 AD. Uh, General Amri and his army, you know, took uh, Egypt um, from, from the Greeks, or the Romans, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they swept through the rest of North Africa, country by country by country. Um, there was a queen, Gaius uh, Cahia uh, of Morocco. You've got to look at these names, like Morocco. Yes. Anything with more in it, that means black. Mauritania, that's, that means black people's land. Oh, and, really? Yeah, it's the languages, the languages. I mean, my, my command of of um, the hieroglyphics is, is, is not good at all, but I have some knowledge from studying it for the last 30, 40 years. But um, the Greeks renamed things. They, the Greeks renamed all of the pharaohs. So, I mean, uh, Khufu, um, Min Tuhotep, um, boy, I mean, the Greeks renamed all these people. So you gotta, you know, kind of scrape through that. It's, 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 that's why I like to go to the original sources. I mean, I read all the books. I read all the books until I went to Egypt. I think I was 40 before I went to Egypt the first time. And, um, you know, because they, they hide it, you know, so well uh, right in front of us. But there are certain scholars, there, there are people who are, are studying this stuff. The association. Uh, well, 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 give, give us, a, uh, as we almost come to close, I like this so much. Give us a ha ha moment for you. That just really, if you, and I know there's a bunch of them, one that might come to mind. If you were to tell a, a group of students, let me tell you this story that would blow their mind. What, what might that story be if you haven't already said it? Boy, I mean, there's there's so many. I mean, there's, yeah, there's, right. there's history and then there's uh, current events and yeah, stuff but, like that. I yeah. mean, from a historical, the Moors would be one, I'm sure. You tell the people about the Moors, people who don't know that would be blown away. You gotta know about General Torak. You got they named the Rock of Gibraltar after General Torak. That's what that means, the Rock of Gibraltar. When Torak sailed across between Morocco and Spain in the- He's summer, a black guy. He's a black guy. And okay. as a matter of fact, his mother had been queen before the Arabs had um, rolled through North Africa and the Arabs killed her. And she told her son, well, if you're gonna stay alive, you gotta switch to Islam. And he did. And so rather than be king in his own land, um, they made him a general because he was a leader. He took 15,000 cavalry. And when they crossed the uh, straits, he burned his ships. And he said, there'll be no retreat. We will kick ass or die. And they kicked ass. They found the, the king of Spain, a guy named Roderick. They trapped him in a valley and they killed them all <laughs> and really? took the country. They took the country. I mean, they were just over on a summer's raid and wound up taking the country. They ruled um, Spain for 800 years. It was called Andalusia. It, was, it wasn't even Spain, it was Andalusia. You got the history of Spain, um, that's, Spain has always been part of Africa. They used to say that Africa ends at the Pyrenees because you gotta consider the Carthaginians. Barcelona 
was named by Hannibal's father. A black man? Yeah. I mean, Hannibal's oh. last name was Barca. Hannibal Barca. So Barcelona, that was named after Hannibal's daddy was the, uh, the Carthaginian general over there. So what I'm saying is Spain was a colony of Carthage for, for hundreds of years before uh, the Romans, you know, finally ran them out of there. Um, I love it. That's a good one. So what, so, so, okay, to the viewers, it's the it, name of, uh, have you, you have some books out, you have videos out that, that kind of explain have, this. Tell us a little bit about what that, um, about, about that effort. African history, African history videos, uh, dot com is, um, my website. Um, and we got, let's see, videos. This is, yeah, I don't know if you can see yeah. this stuff. Yeah, okay. I see it now. This is um, my trips to Egypt. We did uh, trips to Egypt. We did one on the African queens and another piece on the African kings. And then we did a piece on uh, Nubian history. Um, I was in uh, New York one time and went into the Metropolitan Museum uh, when they were having a display of the gold jewelry. Uh, that was taken from the temple of Queen Ashifakato from Meroe. And this jewelry is normally kept um, in Berlin, in, in, in London. Um, but um, it was there in, in New York, and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. With all of the symbols of the cobras and the ancient African symbols, that's a, a video that I did. It's um, the gold of Meroe. Um, let's see. Let's see. Have you written a book? It is in the book. The other one, this one here, we took a trip. I'm a surfer and an old lifeguard. Lawyering and lifeguarding, you know, for me are similar in terms of performing a rescue. Turns okay. me on when you okay. can perform a rescue. But anyway, went surfing down in Fiji. Fiji is about 3,000 miles south of Hawaii, and it's in the Melanesian Sea. And I'm showing this picture because these guys up here, these were kings of Fiji uh, 170, maybe 200 years ago. And look at these froze. Yeah. I mean, look at the hot tops. These, these, yeah. these, these, these are brothers. Not only that, but in the Suva National Museum of Fiji, I found a plaque in which they said that the Fiji people originally came from Thebes, Egypt. Now, Thebes, Egypt is now called Luxor, Egypt. Thebes is what the uh, Greeks called it. But the original name of the ancient capital of Waset, where the Grand Temple of Amun-Ra is, which is across the river from King Tut's tomb, was uh, Waset. But anyway, the Fijians claim that they came from there. And they look like it, too. And the, their, their style of boats the felucas and the boats and the big canoes um, that they got around. Um, you know, that's the same kind of stuff that they were using on the Nile and stuff. Let's go closer to you and and, and maybe, you, I'm sure you probably do. Let's talk about the the in, the uh, explorers that came to Hawaii. There, there are some black people that came to Hawaii back in the early days. Well, the first, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Captain Cook, you know, a British explorer, was the first, um, you know, white person, they say, that came to Hawaii. But there were Black people, Black sailors with him. And they say some of them jumped ship um, and, and stayed. And, and um, King Kamehameha was the Hawaiian king of the Big Island who, and Big Island was where Captain Cook went. And so the Big Island Hawaiians were the first ones to have guns and they you know, use those against the other Hawaiians. Um, that armament and those people um, allowed Kamehameha um, to get the resources to conquer the other islands. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that before the Civil War, 50% of the American merchant marine, uh, they were African-Americans, and many of them were slaves um, because the slave would, excuse me, the, the so-called owner would put the slave on the ship and he'd get paid and the slave would supposedly do the work. Well, many of those uh, 
people were black people. And there was a brother by the name of Anthony Allen who settled in Hawaii long about 1800. And he was here before the missionaries came and this, that, and the other. He was the president of the African Relief Society because when sailors would come and they were sick, um, they had a place for them. He okay. had a bowling alley. Uh, he had a little hotel and okay. a little dram shop. He um, worked for the king, um, making roads and things like that. Um, the first Royal Hawaiian band that was formed by King Kalakaua in 1833 um, was uh, led by a brother by the name of America Shattuck. And many of the musicians, but not all of them, were African Americans in the early 1800s. What I'm saying is that Hawaii was a brown nation, and so um, Black people were welcome in Hawaii. You know, things began to change when the missionaries uh, got stronger and dominant, and eventually they overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy, and, and then they brought in all the American racism with them. Oh, really? So that, that change, and that was like 1893. 1893 was the overthrow by yeah. the Dole, Dole Plantation, the big plantation guys. And yeah. Do you, 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 uh, I guess kind of last week, you know a lot. How do you, how do you, how you, I mean, you've been doing this how long and, and so on and so forth. What can I say, I mean, I'm a history major. It's a fascination. And uh, I guess I've been doing it all my life. I guess I've been doing it all my life. Africanhistoryvideos.com is one website. Okay. Um, some links and then if you put my name on um youtube um i have a channel on youtube okay and, you know, links there not all of my stuff is up because i just don't have time to do that and i, I don't know it's a different yeah. thing about shit that way yeah what, uh, what what um uh what, what what is this called what you do it's the study of black history not transatlantic history is Egyptian history. If you focused on any one of them, what would it be called? I call it world history. I call it okay. There are millions of chapters of world history, and so I I I, I call it world history. I, it certainly has a an African focus, right? You know, I maybe I want to reveal some of the lost or forgotten chapters of African African American history. I got um, you. Focus in on that. Are, are you a historian or is there another term for what you are? I do documentaries. I try to yeah. share yeah. With, with videos. Yeah, people. Wife writes books. She wrote a book about um, African American lawyers in Hawaii. Right. Okay. Uh, interesting brother who was uh, named um, uh, Granville Stewart, who was practicing in Hawaii at the time of the overthrow in the 1890s. And uh, he wound up uh, leaving Hawaii and going to Liberia and becoming a, a Supreme Court justice on the court of Liberia. And his son um, was one of the first lawyers in Portland, Oregon in, um, in the 20s, in the 1920s. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate it. We got to the point where I wanted to get to. And you said it so well, because hey, I want the viewers to know that black people have ruled this thing since the beginning. And we've expanded throughout the whole world. That is the truth, that is the truth. Um, the one thing about going to Fiji, you know, it really opened my eyes to the Melanesian Sea. I mean, all of the people down in the South Pacific are black. Papua New Guinea, all them people are black. <laughs> and it's huge, I mean, the word, Pow Pow, New Guinea. I mean, New Guinea, Guinea was the west coast of Africa. Guinea was the Gold Coast where the British were getting their gold and their money. You know, Guinea is like Nigeria, the Gold Coast. And so New Guinea, you know, it's just a place where they found black people, you know, and that's, that's um, Pow Pow, New Guinea. Um, but I'm just saying all through the South Pacific, the Melanesian Sea, there are black people. And that's evidence of the, the great migration of black people out of Africa over, yeah, over the million years, basically. Oh.
good friend of mine, Renoko Rashidi, passed away last year, but he did books on the African presence in early Asia and early um, Europe. Yeah. He worked with Ivan Van Sertima on some stuff. Van Sertima did a book called, I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, They Came Before Columbus, yeah. talking about the Olmec heads that they found down in uh, Mexico. Uh, down in uh, Ventura, down in Cancun, down around. Sure. I haven't been there, but I've seen videos about it. And sure. Sure. So, yeah. well, hey, 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 man, I really, everybody, <laughs> who did he blow your mind? I know everybody. I jumped around and I can't help it because I, 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 it's, it's too much that, you know, we're we, we going to, please, my brother, you got to oh, come back know. on and we're going to focus on some one area. But you, you said it so succinctly that black people ruled this world. And yeah. uh, did it. go ahead. No, I'm just saying that um, the culture is strong and people, you know, have unlimited talent. And, um, you know, Africa is uniting and, and coming back strong and coming back strong. It's, it's, Hmm. I went to South Africa. I went to South Africa not too long ago. I mean, there's there's people doing interesting things there. Yeah. Um, Ghana, Ghana's. Um, I may be going back to Ghana next summer. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ghana's beautiful. Ghana's, yeah. it may, it's yeah. very positive. Yeah. Everybody, uh, if if there was a love button, you would have to hit it on this one. But it's only a like. But I I do invite you to hit the subscribe. I do invite you to go to his website and, and it's all going to be in the description, you know, support him in the VD the, the, on the YouTube channel, so on and so forth. Cause I, what, what I've come to conclude is I have an expert on the channel today. He's an okay. expert. He's been doing it a ton of years, decades. It's his passion. And he came on to share just some of this as we jumped around and told you, but at the end result, I want you to get out of here. If nothing else, black people are everywhere in the world. And at the beginning, we were the rulers. That's, that's, if you don't get nothing else, get that out of this conversation today. And well, so can, I, go ahead. You can see from the talk about the 1492 project and uh, the people in the South trying to eliminate the discussions of slavery and uh, distort uh, American history, that um, teaching history is just a very political uh, topic and subject, and you really can't get around it. But that's why I just do my own thing. Uh, I'm a lawyer and a, a civil rights lawyer primarily, and that's what uh, allows me to travel and buy these cameras and stuff like that. Mm. But um, you've still got to keep you know, focusing on the people and uh, focusing on educating the children early and uh, not giving them any false limits and uh, things like that. And so hey, just you know. tell them if you do your homework, you can get where you need to go, but you got to do the homework. Everybody, that's the last word. Uh, to you, my brother, I say this and I mean this with all sincerity. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. You an expert at this. Well, That's, it became, it's from a passion to, to, to a life mission. And he knows all of it. And he's documenting. I did want to say is that my father thought he was the first black man in the Washington State Legislature when he served there in 1950. But uh, Owen Bush, um, George Washington Bush, the founder of the state of Washington, was the first black man in the Washington state legislature in 1888. Washington state itself was founded by a black man who led a wagon train because black people were not allowed to stay in Oregon because Oregon had black codes. So in 1834, George Washington Bush and his friends um, crossed the Columbia River and became the first American settlement, integrated settlement in the state of Washington. And, uh, he's a hero. Man, too. Another one of them stories. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. I really thank appreciate you. it. Oh, one more thing. Uh, and, and if you don't mind, close us out in how do you all say goodbye in, in Hawaii and that kind of thing? 
Aloha, aloha, and aloha, and um, Maui Nua, much aloha, and many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll talk soon. Uh, everybody, we out. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you.